Hello from the Channel Studio in London and welcome to another edition of Foreign Dispatches, the program that takes you around the world. I'm Tenyola Oyetayo. On the program this week, Russia mourns victims of concert hall shooting, plus UN Security Council passes Gaza ceasefire resolution with no US veto. We begin in Russia, where a day of national mourning has been held following the death of over 130 people at a concert hall in Moscow. It was the deadliest terror attack Russia has seen in 20 years. The attack came just over a week after Russian President Vladimir Putin cemented his grip on power in a landslide election victory. Moscow residents wait in large queues to lay flowers in tribute to those gone down at a rock concert. The attack at the 6,200-seat venue on Friday night was the deadliest inside Russia for two decades. More than 130 people were killed when four men, armed with automatic weapons, burst into the Crocus City Hall concert venue. More than 180 were injured in the attack. It is impossible to stand aside. I want to share this pain, these losses, and to help people. This is the shared grief of the whole country, people's grief. So my feet just led me here to pay tribute. It was a decision to gather today and lay flowers in memory of those people who lost their lives here, who suffered losses and to express condolences. Russia says it has detained 11 people, including the four gunmen, who fled the scene and were caught not far from the border with Ukraine. Russian media previously identified the men as citizens of the ex-Soviet Republic of Tajikistan living in Russia. The four suspects have been charged with acts of terrorism and the Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the attack. President Vladimir Putin has pledged to track down and punish all those behind the attack. He acknowledged on Monday that it was carried out by Islamic militants but suggested it was also to the benefit of Ukraine and that Kyiv and the West may have played a role. Ukraine has repeatedly denied any role in the attack. The US and other Western countries have also attributed the attack to ISIS, ruling out any Ukrainian involvement. Uh, this was a, a terrorist attack uh, that was conducted by ISIS. Mr. Putin understands that. He knows that very well. And uh, look, it is, there is absolutely no evidence that the government of Ukraine had anything to do with this attack. We've been very clear about that. We continue to strongly condemn the heinous terrorist attack uh, in Moscow. Uh, and we said this before that, uh, you know, we, uh, in early March, the United States, uh, the gov this government shared information with Russia about a planned terrorist, uh, terror attack in Moscow. We were very clear about that. On March 7th, uh, we actually informed uh, Americans in Russia uh, to, to uh, get, did a public advisory, to be more specific. And, uh, you know, ISIS bears the sole responsibility here. Three days before the gunmen targeted the city hall on the northwest fringe of Moscow, the Russian leader accused the U.S. of using its warning of an imminent attack to intimidate and destabilize the country. The Moscow attack blamed by U.S. intelligence on a regional branch of ISIS called Islamic State Khorasan has heightened fears of renewed jihadist plots in Western Europe ahead of a summer of major international sporting events. 
Over to the war in Gaza, the United Nations Security Council has passed a resolution to demand an immediate ceasefire for the first time after the United States abstained from the vote. As a result, Israel lashed out at its ally, labeling its mission of exercising its veto power a clear retreat from its previous position and a move that would hurt war efforts against the mass, as well as efforts to release Israeli captives held in Gaza. A crucial vote at the UN Security Council on Monday laid bare the friction between the United States and its ally Israel over the war in Gaza. Previously, the United States had vetoed three Security Council resolutions over the fighting as Israel pressed its offensive against a mass militants in the Palestinian enclave. But as civilian deaths continued to climb and the humanitarian situation deepened into deadly famine, U.S. President Joe Biden began to press Israel to reach a truce that would allow food and medicine to reach the more than two million civilians trapped there. Will those in favor of the draft resolution contained in document S-2024-254 please their, raise their hand? When the latest resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire went before the Security Council, the U.S. envoy didn't vote. She abstained Abstention. instead. The result of the voting is as follows, 14 votes in favor, zero vote against, one abstention. The draft resolution has been adopted as resolution 2728-224. The chamber erupted into applause as the measure passed. However, the reverberations were immediate. It should be very clear that as long as Hamas refuses to release the hostages in the diplomatic channels, there is no other way to secure their return other than through a military operation. Sadly, it's for the same reason why you can condemn terror attacks in Russia and Iran, but not in Israel. To this council, Israeli blood is cheap. This is a travesty. And I'm disgusted. Following the vote, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu cancelled a planned delegation to Washington that had been requested by the White House. A statement from his office accused the US of having abandoned its previous policy. Israel has a right to the Biden administration had asked to meet with Israeli security officials about a planned offensive in the city of Rafah, where Netanyahu has pledged to eliminate remaining Hamas militants. More than one million civilians have sought shelter in Rafah, and humanitarian groups have warned turning the city into a war zone would turn a humanitarian disaster into an even greater catastrophe. The projected imminent famine in Gaza can and must be prevented. The alarm bells sounded over the past months by the UN, including our office, have not been heeded. This catastrophe is human-made and was entirely preventable. The situation of hunger, starvation and famine is a result of Israel's extensive restrictions on the entry and distribution distribution of humanitarian aid and commercial goods, displacement of most of the population, as well as the destruction of crucial civilian infrastructure. Dangerous coping strategies are already emerging in the face of starvation. Law and order is breaking down as people become increasingly desperate and children have reportedly been sent to make the dangerous journey from northern to southern Gaza, unaccompanied uh, in the desperate hope that they will find food and support 
among the 1.8 million people already displaced there. The UN resolution also came as Israel on Monday announced it would no longer cooperate with the United Nations agency tasked with delivering aid and social services to Palestinians in Gaza. Israel has accused the staff members of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees of participating in the 7th of October attack and has called the agency a front for a mass. Israel has instead started working with other groups in Gaza, such as the UN World Food Programme, to deliver humanitarian aid to Palestinians. Our war is against Hamas, not against the people of Gaza. We do everything we can to distinguish between the terrorists of Hamas to the innocent people of Gaza. We are coordinating and facilitating a humanitarian effort by land, air and sea. This is a tremendous effort. We will keep on doing so and increasing this effort. We are not a bottleneck to any humanitarian aid. The problem is yet the distribution problem. Because of whom? Because of Hamas. Hamas is stealing the aid from the ones in need, from the women and the children. There is also looting. We are acting with the international organizations, and I'm calling the international organizations and the, the countries that are working with us to find solutions with Israel for the distribution mechanism. Speaking in Jordan, the UN chief said blocking the UN agency risked exacerbating starvation across the region. The decision not to allow UNRWA's convoys to go to northern Gaza where we have a dramatic starvation situation is totally unacceptable. And those that took that decision must assume the responsibility facing history of the consequences of the decision in relation to the dramatic situation of the people in northern Gaza, where, as I mentioned, we have already children dying of hunger. There will be no sustainable humanitarian solution with an ongoing war as bloody as this. Let me repeat, nothing justifies the abhorrent October 7 attacks and hostage taking by Hamas, and nothing justifies the collective punishment of the Palestinian people. The effective delivery of humanitarian aid requires the immediate delivery of a humanitarian ceasefire. The need is urgent. Meanwhile, following the vote on Monday, on the ground, there was no indication of a let-up in hostilities as Israeli warplanes continued to bomb Rafah. Israel has asserted its operation in Gaza is defensive after Hamas fighters killed an estimated 1,200 people in an October 7th rampage in Israel and took more than 200 hostages. Palestinian health officials say more than 32,000 Palestinians have been killed so far in five months of war. When foreign dispatches returns after a quick break, we turn to the situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where a conflict-driven hunger crisis worsens as violence in the east surges. More on that in a moment. Please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us on the program. Renewed clashes in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo between the Congolese Army and the M23, a non-state armed group, have triggered massive displacement in recent days, exacerbating an already dire humanitarian situation for thousands of people. More and more people are arriving at overcrowded camps in the east of the country, where there is a lack of food, sanitation, and shelter. Asifawe Peruzi and her eight children fled their home last December when fighting spread to their neighborhood. The family now lives at the Rosayo displacement site in Goma. 
We fled our homes because of fighting. It first started in Mushaki. We thought it would not spread to our area because there were so many soldiers there. We felt safe. Later, the soldiers left and we were worried about our safety. We started hearing gunfire and bombing in the hills. Many bullets were fired near our home area. In recent weeks, a staggering 297,000 people have arrived in the provincial capital of Goma, North Kivu province. Many live in poor and cramped conditions with little or no access to food, health services and education. I fled with my six children while bombs and gunshots were resounding. Since we arrived here, we haven't received any assistance and we're hungry and do not know what to do. The health of my child is worrying. I am terrified and stressed. For my child to be in this severe state means she's getting very little healthy food. Since the eruption of renewed violence on the night of the 18th of March 2022 in the North Kivu province between government forces and non-state armed groups, the conflict has inflicted a staggering toll on civilian populations. Aid agencies have raised alarm about the increase in civilian casualties and the use of heavy weapons in populated areas in recent weeks. Since violent clashes enveloped Sake in Masisi territory on the 7th of February, almost 300,000 people have arrived in Goma and its surroundings, swelling spontaneous and official displacement sites as they desperately seek shelter from indiscriminate bombing and other human rights abuses. Conditions are dire, as growing needs for shelter, sanitation and livelihood opportunities outstrip available resources. A further 85,000 people have fled that same violence and sought shelter in Minova, South Kivu. In January, the town of Minova already hosted over 156,000 displaced people with the majority in makeshift shelters. Some UNHCR teams are bleak. Families continue arriving at sites traumatized and exhausted by the attacks, scarred physically and psychologically. Many report being abused, some sexually, during their flight. According to the World Food Programme, around a quarter of DRC's population 23.4 million people are facing crisis levels of hunger or worse. The conflict has not let up for three years. People have been uprooted from their homes, from their land, not once, not twice, but multiple times. We, as the World Food Programme, we have to be there to give food assistance, to give cash, to make sure that these families don't face hunger, these mothers don't turn around and say, I have no food to feed my children. And we also have to keep telling the international community, don't give up on these people, don't ignore these people, and don't let this situation be tolerated. Far from the country's capital, Kinshasa, eastern Congo has long been overrun by more than 120 armed groups seeking a share of the region's gold and other resources while carrying out massacres. The result is one of the world's largest humanitarian crises, with an estimated 7 million people displaced, many of whom are beyond the reach of aid. And finally on the programme this month, the world marks the International Day of Forests, a day mandated by the United Nations to highlight the importance of these ecosystems in the fight against climate change and to warn of the danger of their degradation. This year's theme, Forests and Innovation, highlights the extraordinary new approaches that are being taken to restore, protect, manage and use our forests sustainably. Take a look. In Papua New Guinea, home to the world's third largest rainforest, indigenous peoples are custodians of almost all the forest land. Now they're being equipped with groundbreaking technology.
These tools, which run on tablets or smartphones, will allow them to demarcate their forest and monitor the area to make sure it stays healthy and intact from incursions. Like his father before him, Bester Pulum has lived his whole life looking after 800 hectares of dense tropical forest, about 550 kilometers northwest of Papua New Guinea's capital, Port Moresby, in the remote western highlands. The forest hosts a rich variety of animals and bird species. Monitoring large swathes of thick forest can be hugely time-consuming and challenging to do for even the most experienced. This was my father's land. Now it is my land and I'm looking after it. Looking back in the past, if I wanted to look for my border, I would walk there. I would walk up to the mountain with my water and go all around my border. Bester Pulum can now look at high-resolution satellite imagery of the forest to help him pinpoint its boundaries without having to trek for days. This technological innovation was brought about by Aim for Forests, a pioneering initiative launched in 2023 by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and the United Kingdom. The project aims both to provide countries with the technological means to combat deforestation and to ensure the active participation of indigenous peoples in forest monitoring. While indigenous peoples comprise just 5% of the population, they steward 25% of Earth's land. Through projects like these, FAO is helping them to protect and sustainably manage their land. We are in the midst of a forest data revolution and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations is at the forefront of this. Here in Papua New Guinea, we are supporting the government and local communities to collect new data to boost their efforts to protect, restore and sustainably used forests. Innovations are happening across the globe in very diverse fields. In the clothing and fashion industry, where currently over 60% of textiles are plastic-based, New textiles derived from sustainable wood are being pioneered to replace some of these fibres. Sophia Ilmanen is a Finnish designer working with these new materials. I think using wood-based materials could be a game changer. People really want to know what their clothes are made of and choose better, more responsible uh, options. The material is strong but at the same time is soft. It has a really good drape and it's easy to work with. There's so much innovation happening in my field and it's super exciting to be part of it. Knowing that while I work and I, I can do what I love and to be able to do it more responsibly, it's motivating. Another area of promising innovation is with buildings. The construction sector is responsible for high greenhouse gas emissions. New advances in the use of sustainable wood show how it is possible to find better ways to keep up with the construction demand. By 2030, we will have to house an additional 3 billion people. But the construction sector alone is responsible for approximately 37% of energy and process related greenhouse gas emissions. We do need to try and find a better way to build housing. And this is where mass timber comes into play. It reduces the carbon footprint of buildings and it stores carbon for its lifetime. And this can make wood-based construction almost an extension of our forests. The world faces unprecedented challenges and new solutions that can sustainably address these challenges are of crucial importance. Mandated by the United Nations, the International Day of Forests celebrates and raises awareness of the importance of all types of forests each year. On each International Day of Forests, countries are encouraged to undertake local, national and international efforts to organise activities involving forests and trees, such as tree planting campaigns, to help bring attention to these vital natural resources. And that's the programme today, but remember our top stories are never far away. You can catch them on channelcv.com. Thank you for watching. I'm Tenyola Uyutayo. Bye for now.